Hello, I'm Elena, here to join me for a history-filled walk around London. Today I thought we could start and end in Tower Hill. We've got skulls and Roman graves, music halls and yachts, we've really got it all. There's lots to see gang, so let's get going. From Tower Hill Station, let's walk past the Four Seasons Hotel to the fantastically named Seething Lane. Here we have St. Olave's Church, the parish church frequented by famous 17th century Londoner Samuel Pepys, who was here during the Great Plague of London in 1665 and the Great Fire of London of 1666, and wrote about them both in his private diary. That's certainly no longer private. So who was Olave? He was in fact the Norwegian King Olaf, who helped Ethelred the Unready, still my favourite kingly name ever, to pull down London Bridge in 1014, in Ethelred's bid to reclaim the British crown. A church was built here in Olaf's memory not long after his death. Not this exact one though, this church dates from about 1450 and it got lucky and escaped without any damage from the 1666 Great Fire of London that burnt down most of the city. Notice the curious set of skulls above the entrance? This is what first piqued my interest. The actual reason they're here isn't known for sure, but it's thought to be because many of the Great Plague of London victims were buried here, including Mary Ramsey. She is blamed for being patient zero, the one who brought the bubonic plague to London from France, which ended up killing between 75 to 100,000 people, almost a quarter of London's entire population at the time. Bit of an unfortunate legacy. I was curious about this three-storey pub as I walked along Hart Lane, but haven't really been able to find out much about it. I did find out this pub was built in 1887, but a pub has been on this site since at least 1791. Also, the south side of Hart Street, so likely where the ship is today, was said to be the site of Whittington Palace, the home of the Lord Mayor of London, Dick Whittington, which wasn't really a palace, but a huge mansion carved from oak. But anyway, we admire the maritime designs and we move on. Now we come upon the remains of All Hallows Staining. A seemingly trivial detail, this church doesn't have a steeple, actually the same as St. Olave's. I found an interesting nugget of info though that this means a church is likely a survivor of the Great Fire of London, because when the famous architect Sir Christopher Wren rebuilt the city churches, he introduced steeples into his designs, and churches built since are often also built with a spire or steeple to conform to his designs. The very first mention of a church here was before 1291, this tower, which is all that is left now, dates from about the 1320s. And why All Hallows Staining? One of the theories is that it takes its name from um, this phrase, which I can't pronounce, meaning stone hive, because this church was made from stone, possibly the very first, or at least one of the first, stone churches to be built in London, where all other churches had been built out of wood. We do love a church on our history walks, particularly in the area that St. Helens stands, because these old buildings are completely surrounded by modern sky rises. This, for example, is the backside of Leaden Hall building, the building with a 10 degree tapered front, because the sight line between Parliament Hill to St. Paul's is protected by law, so the building has to basically lean out of the way of the protected view. Anyway, back to the church, St. Helen's Bishop's Gate is the largest surviving church in the City of London, with a medieval appearance, despite being damaged by IRA bombs in 1992 and 1993. Who was Helen? Helen was the mother of Emperor Constantine, the first Christian Roman Emperor. A nunnery formed part of the church for 300 years, and it seems like the nuns like to get up to more trouble than they should have. In 1385, a nun who was suffering from gout convinced the Pope to provide her with a yearly £10 allowance to support her. The prioress apparently didn't like that, locking her in her room with minimal food until the Dean of St Paul's had to rescue her. Around 1432, the prioress was reprimanded for owning too many dogs, although we don't know how many dogs was deemed too many. And sometime in the 1300s, nuns were also reprimanded for kissing secular persons. What can we say? These nuns knew how to have a good time. We're dipping round the corner now to St Ethelburgers, the smallest church in the city. The current building dates from the 1400s, though a church has been on this site we think since 1180. New Yorkers may be interested to know that Henry Hudson and his crew took communion here on April 19th, 1607, before setting sail in the Hopewell to search for the Northwest Passage. In 1609, he discovered the Hudson River at the mouth of now New York. 
but he met a mysterious end. In 1611, he sailed into what is now known as Hudson's Bay. He was cast adrift with his 12-year-old son by his mutinous crew and simply disappeared. Back to St. Ethelburgers, it was also badly damaged by the IRA bomb in 1993, but eventually the exterior was restored to its medieval roots. The interior has now been redesigned to house the centre of reconciliation and peace, and in the courtyard stands a 16-sided Bedouin tent covered in goatskins as a quiet place for people to meditate. Now I could tell you all about the Gherkin, one of London's most iconic skyscrapers which opened in 2004 with 41 floors and an amazing restaurant and bar at the top where I spent my 30th birthday, however what I want to talk to you about is a little lower down, in the ground in fact. As I've mentioned a couple times already, in 1992 the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, planted their first bomb outside the Baltic Exchange where it exploded. There was huge devastation, but the bomb exposed a deep layer of London which had been hidden for thousands of years. While clearing the site for reconstruction, archaeologists discovered the remains of a young Roman girl, thought to have been between 13 and 17 years old when she died, between about 350 AD and 400 AD, just before the Romans left London in 410 AD. Nothing more was discovered about her, but rather than keep her remains in a museum, she was reburied at the base of the gherkin and given as accurate as possible ancient Roman funeral rites. London had actually banned any new burials in the city in the 1850s, but in 2007, legislation was passed to allow the reuse of burial plots if the previous occupant had been in the site for more than 75 years. So 1,600 years should just about cover it. The Old Gate Pump plays a part in London's more gruesome history. This is a very old site indeed, with early mention of an Old Gate well from the 13th century. The pump itself was mentioned in 1598 and was such a focal point in the city that once the roads of London were measured from its spot. Not the current spot though, as it was moved a little in 1876. It provided free, pure and fresh water for locals, but in the early part of the century, the taste changed to either taste much better than it ever did, or to taste really off. Sources seem to disagree, but it was the start of something terrible. Londoners in this area started to die mysteriously by the hundreds. After an investigation, it was discovered that the water coming out of the Old Gate pump was passing through newly built cemeteries, picking up bacteria from the dead bodies that had been buried in the way. The pump was eventually connected to a mains water supply, ending the epidemic. The current pump is 18th century with some 19th century bits. The wolf head is a reference to the tale that this is apparently where the last wolf was shot in the city of London, though no one is willing to put their money on that one for sure. There was a gas lamp on top that disappeared at one point, however in 2019 a new nod to the gas lamp was installed. This random London street was once the site of one of the most brutal hand-to-hand -hand fights ever seen in modern London, between a large burgeoning Jewish community in the East End of London and Oswald Mosley's Black Shirts, a fascist mob of anti-Semites who had been rallied by Mosley to blame the Jewish communities for the worsening conditions in the East End. The Black Shirts held multiple marches, protests and demonstrations around London, with Hitler and his treatment of Jews at the same time in Germany being a huge influence. On the 4th of October 1936, Mosley and the Black Shirts held a march in the East End for their group's fourth anniversary, after the government refused to ban the march, leaving it to the East Enders to defend their community themselves. A bus was overturned to be used as a barricade, the streets were littered with broken glass and marbles, which makes this sound like a terrible cartoon. Residents from second and third floor homes hurled objects down onto the crowd, and the Black Shirts were eventually redirected away from the East End. All that's left here to show what happened is this plaque and a mural down the road. Now, if you happen to be walking down Grace's Alley for some reason, you'd be forgiven for completely missing this absolute gem of a sight, marked by a huge iron gas lamp and an old wooden door. Wilton's Music Hall is the oldest surviving music hall in the world, and by that we mean it's a giant pub hall. And the coolest thing, especially for those of you who aren't able to easily make it to London, is if you go on Google Maps and drop the little yellow man on Wilton's Music Hall, you can take a tour of the rooms inside. 
It started out as a small theatre in the back of a pub until in 1850 John Wilton expanded it out as he bought up the neighbouring properties. In 1859 it opened as a new grand hall with a space for 1,500 people and the Can Can was premiered at Wilton's. I thought that was pretty cool. Unfortunately a fire ravaged the building in 1877 and it eventually was bought and used as a Methodist hall. But they didn't have much money to spend on the building, so thankfully very little of what was left was changed. It was also used as a shelter for the people who lost their homes in the Blitz, and for the people involved in the Battle of Cable Street. In 1956 it became a warehouse and could have fallen into complete disrepair, except the British Music Hall Society stepped in to save and preserve it. It's now actively run as a music hall, putting on plays, operas and exhibitions, and has even been used as a film location. Catherine docks of today are filled with luxury boats and surrounded by luxury apartments, but the history of the area of St. Catharines can be traced back to the 12th century, when King Stephen's wife Matilda built a hospital here dedicated to St. Catherine. With the British Empire expanding, merchant ships from the Caribbean bringing in sugar and rum decided to build new enclosed tide-free docks all along the Thames, including at St. Catharines, making it a major hub of activity. As the community in this part of London grew, by the start of the 19th century, it housed warehouses, shops, taverns, brothels and slum houses. Until the 19th century, this area always fell under the Queen Consort's protection and attempts to demolish or change it were rebuffed. However, in 1825, during a window when there was no Queen Consort to protect it, the St. Catherine Dock Bill was passed in Parliament, which meant buildings in the area were demolished, including the still-standing medieval hospital it made 11,300 residents homeless. The layout we see today was constructed then and the docks reopened in 1828. The docks were a key target of the Nazis and were bombed in the Blitz over two days, which caused 4,600 casualties and losses, and the area couldn't really recover from it and closed in 1968. What probably helped the docks is that it lies so close to the city of London, so you can't really leave that much real estate abandoned for too long. Now the area is a hub of activity with restaurants, bars, festivals and food markets. This incredibly fine looking building is called the Dickens Inn after Charles Dickens. This may lead you to think it must have been a local boozer for him, but no. This wood framed 18th century building was just a warehouse for either tea or owned by a local brewery in his day and has no actual connection to the man himself. The building actually originally stood about 70 metres east of where it is now and its 120 tonne timber frame was carefully moved so that it wasn't demolished. It opened as a pub in 1976 by Cedric Charles Dickens, who said, my great grandfather would have loved this inn. So that's something, isn't it? Rather than a place of historical significance, this is just a great place to stop and enjoy some drinks or grab lunch or dinner on one of its many flowered balconies. London's iconic Tower Bridge really deserves its own video, but I'm just going to give you a brief rundown of the best bits while we're here. The design for Tower Bridge was actually chosen from a public competition where over 50 designs were submitted and was deliberately made to look as aesthetically pleasing as the nearby Tower of London to fit the look for the area. The original design said it was supposed to be mounted with guns, but the idea was discarded. It took eight years to build, twice as long as planned, and was completed in 1894. The bridge actually used to be a chocolate brown colour and was repainted to red, white and blue in 1977 to celebrate the Queen's Silver Jubilee. Its 240 metre road can rise in the middle to let tall ships through and takes 7 to 10 minutes to open. In 1952, bus driver Albert Gunther was driving the number 78 bus over the bridge when it started to open. A relief watchman had failed to ring a warning bell and closed the gates. 
Albert had to accelerate and jump the bus over a three-foot gap and dropped six feet onto the north side, which hadn't started to rise yet. Because no one was injured, he was rewarded £10, or about £290 in today's money, for his act of bravery. In 1997, America's Bill Clinton was on a visit to London and was driving with his motorcade towards the bridge. Some of his security detail had already crossed the bridge, but Bill Clinton's car hadn't yet, as the Thames sailing barge Gladys arrived on time to get to St. Catherine Docks, and they opened the bridge for her anyway and split the convoy. The security staff, as you can imagine, were not best pleased, but the spokesperson for Tower Bridge said we tried to contact the American Embassy, but they wouldn't pick up the phone. Before we leave Tower Bridge, take a closer look at the lampposts. Notice something odd? This one doesn't have a lamp. It is in fact an old, unused chimney. It used to be connected to a coal fire in the Royal Fusiliers room, so they could warm up there while on guard duty, until it stopped in 1956. A small area you might not notice underneath the north side of Tower Bridge is called Dead Man's Hole. It's a remnant from Victorian times when bodies used to regularly wash up in this particular area. Why? Well, they were likely the victims of murder, suicide or accidental drowning, and the river's flow would just direct them here. The steps that lead down into the water have no modern function, so are likely there in order to have made collecting the bodies easier. The bodies were then dragged up and placed in the alcove until they could be identified and buried. If you're walking in this part of Tower Hill, no doubt you are looking at the Tower of London. It is a sight to behold, and trying to spot a beef eater is all the more fun. So you may not notice this round building set apart from it, the Tower Subway. Outside a subway. In 1869, a quarter mile long tunnel was dug in order to build a passenger railway from Tower Hill to Tooley Street on the South Bank. It could only take 12 passengers at a time to trek the one minute, 10 second route, and broke down twice during a press-only experimental run, which wouldn't have helped with its publicity. Then a passenger was killed in a lift accident at the southern end. His head was crushed between the top of the lift and the edge of the ground floor. The railway stopped in 1870, but it appears people could still pay to walk through the tunnel. 20,000 a week in fact did. Not that it was a pleasant experience. Robberies down there were also common, but it managed to last 30 years before Tower Bridge opened and people preferred to walk over in clean air. And now here we are, back at the place where my Hidden Gems walking tour ended, at the Tower of London, founded in 1066. This building is one of my absolute favourites in London, and I still highly recommend their audio tour if you happen to visit. There's too much to cover here, and let's be honest, this video is long enough, so let's leave it for now. But if you can't make it here, as with the Wilton Music Hall, spend half an hour dropping that little yellow Google Maps man onto the various picture points to take a look inside. Hope you enjoyed coming on a walk with me. It only took you minutes, but took me two hours, so I'm off to get a bite to eat. See you in the next video.